Coca, su naray, su naray en ti. 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 Hello, hi. Welcome to this new episode of the Mango TV podcast. Today, I'm very grateful to have Trisha Eastman. Eastman is a medicine woman, author, artist, speaker, and advocate for the psychedelic movement and founder of nonprofit Ancestral Heart. Eastman has created a wellness retreat center, Thermal Hot Springs, under construction in São Miguel Island in the Azores, to open in 2024. Eastman's book, Seeding Consciousness, Plant Medicine, Ancestral Wisdom, and the Path to Transcendence is coming out in 2023. As a medicine woman, Eastman has curated retreats in country where it's legal working fav with Favemio DMT and Iboga for eight years. She has been initiated into multiple branches of Buiti, the ancestral tradition from Equatorial Africa, working with Iboga, as well as facilitated the Saco spiritual program with Ibogaine and Favemio DMT at Crossroads Treatment Center in Mexico. Thank you for being here. Welcome, Trisha. Honored to be here and just this is such a beautiful space being in the island of Ibiza and just so grateful to be plugged into this beautiful community. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. As our listener knows, Mango TV has been following the psychedelic uh, renaissance from the early stage. I remember one of the first MAPS conference in Auckland, something like around 2004-2005, I remember there was maybe 30, 40 people. And then an article the following day on the local newspaper said, um, group of hippies celebrate preliminary and inconclusive research. <laughs> Today I feel like maybe calling the reporter and say, what do you think? Um, okay, so let's start from the beginning. Yes. Um, I usually like to have, a, let's say, a three-part conversation, one more personal, one around your practice, and then one about more global. So how did you get interested in this medicine? What was your cathartic moment when you decided, okay, I'm going to dedicate my life mm. to this medicine? It's interesting because my first relationship with psychedelics was through my father, who, who used a lot of cannabis. And... Um, when I was, uh, right when I was going to college, I worked for a psychedelic bookstore called Raver Books, and we had all the top classics from Timothy Leary and, you know, Tycal Faikal, Alexander Shulgin, Ram Dass, all of that. And um, I stepped away from the psychedelic movement when my father was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which was triggered by um cannabis. Um, and so I was afraid I would break my brain uh, taking psychedelics after this incident happened in my 20s. And later on, I rediscovered MDMA after having a traumatic brain injury where I had induced um, really high anxiety. And um, that led me to looking into plant medicine, discovering ayahuasca, which opened the doorway into this pathway of uh, healing a lot of ancestral trauma that I believe is actually the source of my father's schizophrenia. And interestingly, um, over the years, especially after I started working with Iboga, which I discovered in 2014, um, the work that I was doing, and I don't, I'm not taking credit in any way, it just seemed very synergistic and synchronistic that a lot of his symptoms um, started to subside with his schizophrenia. And he actually, um, he was living in uh, Hawaii. He moved back to the United States, or into um, Washington State, and uh, built a hydrogen powered car, which I never would have thought, you know, he would have, he, cause he was just like sitting around very depressed, not really doing a lot. And I didn't think there was a lot I could do for him, but just, you know, it, it's hard with schizophrenia because, you know, when you, um, do a lot of this plant medicine work, uh, you, you a lot of times have things come up around your relationship with your parents and, and healing with your parents. And with schizophrenia, um, there's a lot of times where you just can't connect 
and, you know, times where um, my father would be manic, which is a big part of, of schizophrenia, where, um, you know, it would feel like I was being like, kind of like overly <laughs> pushed with 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 information and, and urgency to connect and, um, you know, very overwhelming. So it's a very kind of hard relationship because um, it doesn't feel like something that you could therapeutically transform. And so it's been it's been really amazing to to go down that road and, and find healing. So specifically, where, where were we in which year when, when you start experience with one of these plants? When um, the experience that was most transformational for me was um, in 2014, I met Martin Polanco, who owned Crossroads Clinic in Mexico. And I had already done quite a bit of plant medicine work, but I wasn't quite getting down to the core of my um, eating disorders. And I had anorexia, bulimia, body dysmorphic disorder, and I just couldn't get to the core of like what it meant to love myself and how could I accept myself. And it wasn't until I met Iboga um, and the spirit of Iboga in this journey, which was in a medical clinic in Tijuana, which, which sounds like a very unlikely place to have that experience. And um, in the experience, I, I saw my true self. I saw myself as a fractal of the universe. And in like connecting to my true self, I realized this is silly. Why would I even be constricted by this false construct of separation and was able to fully love and accept myself for the first time? And when I had that experience, um, the first thing I did was just pour out tears. And I cried for a long time. And after I cried, I said, uh, Iboga, how can I be of service to you? And within three weeks, Martin Polanco asked me to facilitate the psycho-spiritual program at Crossroads. So I never sought out this um, idea of working with others with medicine. I had experience working with others as a facilitator, doing healing work, doing more like shamanic work, but without psychoactive substances. And um, I never would have thought that I would have been chosen by the medicine to to walk this path. And it's been truly the greatest honor I could ever have expected. And by the way, I um, it's interesting because as I was sharing the story, I don't talk about my father's uh, schizophrenia. Um, and, you know, that relationship, I could just feel some like emotions coming up. And so I'm, I'm grateful to have this vulnerable conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But so let's jump straight into the big topic of um, you know mental disease and the origin of this um, you know mental condition you're describing um, Gabor Mate has this theory that um, all most all um, you know it's very controversial that most most of this you know the typical you know you mentioned bulimia or depression anxiety PTSD um, basically they are originated in 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 childhood trauma yes when when um, and he describes two 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 phenomena one is the loss of authenticity yeah and one is uh, the interiorization of unworthiness yes so he says that you know when you're like four five six seven eight your parents get distracted which has nothing to do with you yeah but you interpret as they don't love me i'm not worthy yes so that's is like a psychic fracture yes then you want to get the attachment back so you lose your authenticity Yes, and you earn it. You try to earn it. You try to earn it. Yes. And so these two phenomena create like like a like um like an injury, like a cut. Mm -hmm. Um and um and then this psychic injury it's like Jung says the subconscious rules your life and you call it fate, right? So yeah. is this idea that this psychic injury then subconsciously put into situation that in a way exacerbate the injury yes. so you end up in um, abusive relationship and basically yeah. things to confirm yes. that you're not lovable exactly it's like the opposite of a normal cat a normal cat you would like make sure that you don't go to the sea that it that it's it it, it heals yes but the injury in the, in, in the psyche it's like reverse so um, my question to you is do you think 
that that was the origin of your um, you know bulimia and 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 how do you think that the me- the you know neurologically the medicine might have impacted on this neurological injury yeah i mean i think that it it's definitely like i mean how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go with this <laughs> uh, it's it's both um the actual you know, egoic framework, which which forms when you're between zero and seven, it starts in the womb where um, you start to record these patterns and these patterns become your your framework. But then if you want to go a little deeper, you know, Stan Groff has gone um, very deep into the work of the perinatal matrix and the link of archetypal astrology. And the idea of the perinatal matrix is kind of that when you're in the womb, you kind of relive this archetypal story, like your own specific hero's journey, which is related to your astrology. So, for instance, for myself, um, my mother um, is a Roycis negative, and my father is Roycis positive blood type. And what happens in pregnancy when a uh, Roycis negative and Roycis positive father is positive, the mother's negative, is the mother tries to abort the fetus. And so that creates a stress on the baby. And that stress can show up as being, um, it might be the feeling of being attacked, the feeling of being at war. Um, for me, what, what it felt like was, um, you know, the feminine rejecting me. And that affected my relationship with the feminine, which, you know, anorexia, bulimia, all of that is about our relationship to the feminine. And if you go even further, like for me, specific to my story, my mother's mother um, had cancer when I was in the womb and she died a month before I was born. And so she was carrying all this grief and all that, that was what was feeding me as a baby. I was feeling that grief. And she I died think, one month after you were born. Yeah, so a month before I was born, she passed. And so so I was born in October. She passed in September. And um, so she tried to live long enough to see me. And my mom was um, very young when she was pregnant. She became pregnant at 17. She had me when she was 18. So she was very young when she lost her mother. And what happened was, you know, what I saw, and this was shown to me through Iboga and then other like integrational work that I've done to kind of pull all the pieces together, that um, when she had me, she um, was so deep in grief. And, and, you know, if you study different medicine, like ancient medicine, like traditional Chinese medicine, they talk about grief being in the breasts. So she didn't actually make um, breast milk. And so as a baby, um, she gave me Similac, other formulas, which um, I was allergic to. And I literally would like throw up all the time, you know, like how babies spit up. I would spit up my food. So I was rejecting my first nourishment from my mother. But obviously I knew, you know, not saying I knew, knew, but uh, that it was um, not the real nourishment that, you know, comes from the mother, which is the breast milk. And I had diaper rashes. And um, what happened was I think over um, my lifetime, I developed all these food allergies that were a result of this improper nourishment as a child that um, eventually, um, you know, gave me this disordered relationship with food where um, I didn't really understand how food worked within my body as a supportive thing. The other thing that I feel that it created and manifested was, um, well, one of the things that happened was I was bullied very badly by women growing up all the way from elementary school to high school. Where where was that? Um, I grew up in Carnation, Washington, which is a very small farm town outside of uh, Seattle, Washington. And um, what's interesting about that is it was, again, the same perinatal matrix story of the mother rejecting, the feminine rejecting, like from a social standpoint, feeling that these women were rejecting me. And, um, and then the eating disorders, which were really the rejection of the the mother um so yeah it's it it's a big rabbit hole but very much connected to you know that patterning but i think even beyond 
um, you know, what my mother showed me as an example, because my mother is the most loving person. She is a saint. She, um, my mother is, um, my family's from Mexico on my mother's side. She's half, so I'm a quarter. And so we're, our, our lineage is uh, the Mestiza lineage. And um, she uh, has this ancient lineage that goes back, which is really rooted in uh, prayer and connection to nature. And so even though um, like my family carried this lineage all the way up to my grandfather and then he switched to Catholicism, she still kind of had that orientation in her of how she approached things. And she taught me how to pray and how to like really connect to spirit. And I feel like that kind of uh, rooted this indigenous principle inside me that that I see in all the traditions that I've, you know, connected with and studied. Um, but in that sense, like, I don't feel like there's anything lacking from my mother. Like, as a person, she was, like, really, really loving and caring and took care of me. She was a stay-at-home mom. She didn't go off to work and leave me um, and always just super supportive. Um, but that whole story in the womb was, I think, really what, what brought about the eating disorders. Wow. So, so in addition to the... Um Gabor Mate, um, loss of authenticity and an and interiorize of unworthiness, there is, you know, biological effect that yeah. affect your mental health. Yeah. And then you're mentioning something key for the shamanic practice, which is the ancestral material. Yes. Huge. That's it, is what people, you know, in our Western materialistic paradigm is a little bit more difficult to understand. So why don't we try to unpack that a little bit deeper? And so where you, how old were you when you met Iboga? I was, um, I was, let's see, 35 when I met Iboga. Yeah. And did you have an understanding of the origin of your disease where you, it was clear for you where was that it was rooted in, in, in your mother condition and then in the rejection of the formula that was already clear to you or is something you discover with the medicine? Something that I discovered with the medicine, but I think the, the beautiful thing about Iboga, and this is to me feels different than um, a lot of the other medicines that I had worked with in the past, is that the spirit stays with you for a very long time. And not only that, but the alkaloids are stored in your fat. So literally after you work with the medicine, going through an initiation or like in this case it was a flood dose in an abogain clinic it stays in your fat so the spirit is with you and interestingly the um you know like in most of the initiations that i've that i've um done it which i've done three initiations in the fong tradition of buiti and one initiation in the gonde masoko tradition of buiti um i've always been told to take a year off from medicine to not work with any other medicines and you can feel it deeply working with you throughout that entire year while you're really focused and that's that's why it's become one of my primary medicines because I'm not allowed you know when I when I go through these initiations to you know work with anything else because it can kind of um interfere with with what's already in place of course i was microdosing with iboga as i was integrating so i wasn't taking zero medicine but in terms of taking those big initiatory doses um you know that was that was done like one time in that initiation or sometimes in certain initiations you do you know two nights of ceremony which they call the death and the rebirth and um, and then I was taking, you know, a year of, of integration time. And in that time, these little pieces of the puzzle, these little parts of my soul were being retrieved. And I um, in my book, I talk about the process of uh, soul kintsugi, which is the art of soul repair. And it's that idea of. Um, you know, the broken vessel that in the ancient Japanese art is melded together with gold. And that's what we do in this medicine work with integration is we put those pieces back together and we, we mend them with gold. And that's through our choice of consciousness, bringing the unconscious to consciousness. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm very tempted to ask your personal experience more in detail with Iboga, but I think we're going to explore that in the 
in another episode um, around the psychedelic confessions. Um, but so I, I would like to understand your interpretation of, because, you know, I understand when you say spirits stay with you, but imagine our little bit more secular audience. Um, how would you describe the existence of spirit into an equatorial bush, African bush? I mean, how do you see evolutionary the presence of this in plant intelligence on a bush in Gabon? You know, my belief in just this incredible work with nature and connecting with other spirits of nature, maybe non-psychoactive plants, including trees, um, is that, um, you know, all all plants have spirits. And these spirits, in my opinion, of, you know, witnessing the level of intelligence and access they have is beyond what humans, you know, we have these limitations because we have to egos. Yeah. yeah. And I feel that the best described um, model for this type of understanding is Rupert Sheldrake, um, his idea of morphogenic fields. And the morphogenic field concept is this idea that, you know, really there's a logos that exists like an intelligence field with whether it's animals, bees, um, plants. And then if you go more into the um, actual, um, it's like the it's the brain of the intelligence and it's the lifetime of experiences, however old that particular um, thing is and this also exists in the spirit realm and in shamanic traditions like Bwiti they also believe in this concept of the egregore which is the collective spirit of the medicine and the egregore is a um, combination of the lineage every person that's walked in that lineage how that lineage has been carried how pure it is um as well as all the entities connected to that lineage and the plant itself. So there's an entire intelligence. And interestingly, in ceremonies, we have this opening uh, protocol or rite ritual that um, when we open the portal, um, people have said they literally saw like, this, the 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 fabric of reality opening even before they took medicine and like pygmies and you know which are the forest people of equatorial Africa that brought iboga to Buiti and other you know spirits coming out of it so it's quite interesting yes beautiful um, so let's say if I can paraphrase what you're saying just to have a, another explanation so Rupert Sheldrake talks about this um, cosmic memory bank yes that you know there is a there is a knowledge in the ether mm -hmm. from ever that's why sometimes you know if you have um, ayahuasca in the jungle you have the vision of the jungle deity because you tap you know you you know some of this medicine and this altered state allow you to travel and to access they're like they're like doors in this field of knowledge a little bit like the um, you know Madame Blavatsky was talking about the Akashic record, right? Yes, yes. So um, that's why there is the um, this study about the monkeys in the in the next by islands, mm -hmm. and you know one group of monkeys in one island discovered that the potato without the sun tastes taste better, and almost simultaneously, the 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 monkey in the island nearby get the same knowledge. Yes. Also, for humans, there is this study that says that you know since there's been study of IQ, mm -hmm. then, you know, humans have been basically doing better and better because it is in the field. Yes. It's, it's, it's a bit tricky to understand. Um, another example was, um, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to synthesize a new crystal, but then once it's synthesized, to replicate is much faster. Yes. So what I'm trying to explain with this example is that... Um, is this esoteric co concept that um, these medicine are portals to a different dimension where there might be a knowledge of integration with, with the human body that allow a process of, of wholeness, of yes. healing. Yes. Amazing. So, so you felt this calling of, of, of um, working with this medicine. 
Um, and so synchronistically, you get offered to work at the Crossroad, this center in Mexico. Uh, and that's, you know, you started supervising sessions. And so how was, um, how was your experience? How did, it de de how did it develop? What did you learn from observing other people? Yeah, um, observing, uh, you know, when I first started working um, at Crossroads, it was in a medically supervised environment. And, you know, I wasn't just giving the medicine on my own. You need a lot of training um, to work with this medicine, especially Iboga. It was sa salocine. Uh, sorry, it was uh, Ibogaine. Ibogaine, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, in the beginning, I was really learning and observing and um you know, it was so interesting. I remember witnessing... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Trisha. Is it fair to say that Ibogaine is what THC is to cannabis? Yes. Yeah, is so the active it, component? So it, Ibogaine or Iboga is one of the most, um, like, complex plants of the plant kingdom. It has over 30 known alkaloids that work on almost every neurotransmitter system in the body. And Ibogaine is one of those alkaloids. Um, it wasn't um, even able to be synthesized because of the complexity of it until they discovered a similar plant in Africa called Volkanja and pulled this um, Volkanjaline, which is an alkaloid from the Volkanja Africana. And um, they were able to take off like a hydrogen or, or mo oxygen molecule through chemistry and actually what they call a semi-synthesis of abogaine. So most of the abogaine used in the world is derived from volcongeline. My understanding, although I have not seen the science behind it, is that there are some companies that have now gotten to the point where there might be a formulation or something that exists that is an actually purely synthetic form of, of Abogaine. And so I interrupt, but so we were saying that supervising people, how, yes. how was your, how has been your experience um, in, in um, been, you know, witnessing thousands of people in, in all these years? Is there like a um, similar archetypal content coming through? How would you... I imagine you were doing some um, questionnaire to the people and um, can you like, you know, like explain by, you know, broad stroke, um, the typical, um, what kind of, what kind of ailment people would come with yeah. and, 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 and describe it. I know there's not such a thing as a typical healing process, yes, but yes. do your best. Um, it's interesting because I feel that when people come to Iboga, usually they have some significant experience with other medicines because it is the Mount Everest of all of the psychoactive plant medicines. Um, and it's completely different than all of them. So whatever their expectations are, they come in and those get kind of blown out of the water. And more often than not, people are completely incapacitated. So literally the aboga um, turns your insides out in the sense that it inc incapacitates you from being able to walk, from being able, to, it, it turns all the senses inward so that you uh, don't try to um, distract yourself with external stimulus because it's really forcing you to look at the deepest, darkest corners of yourself that maybe you had been running away from, from addiction or because of some trauma. And, um, Every single person that I've experienced, you know, says they get their ass kicked, basically, that, you know, it kind of knows exactly what to serve up to that person to kind of push them on that edge that, that can be very difficult. The actual experience of the medicine is difficult. It feels uncomfortable because you can't move. Um, if you try to listen to outside noises, you can get this intense like buzzing, like almost like there's bees inside your ears to keep you from trying to distract yourself with something else. Um, you have a lot of physical shaking. If you have to get up and go to the bathroom, the minute you set up, you start feeling very nauseous. It's a purgative. So um, you can expect to purge maybe and most likely more than one time from the medicine. So you sit up, you start feeling really dizzy. You need to have help to walk to the bathroom if, um, if you have to go to the bathroom. And um, it, it really, truly just takes you into the deepest pain. That can be just being completely attacked 
with your thoughts and your thought patterns. But in the beginning, usually like in the initiations that I've experienced and in the psycho-spiritual work that I do, you do two nights of ceremony. The first night is the death. The second night is the the rebirth. And in the night of death, usually that's the most uncomfortable night because you have all this stuff. How many grams? It's different for everybody. The dosage range is so um, varied. Um, You know, I've had people that took one spoonful of root bark, which is is basically the the form of iboga that comes from the root of the plant. Um, It's like the inner layer of the root bark, which is very, very bitter, by the way. Um, probably one of the most bitter things you you could have in your in your life, and and it's hard to to swallow, and many people have difficulty even just taking the medicine. Um, but it, it, you know, someone who has a high tolerance could take seven, eight, nine, you know, maybe even up to fourteen spoonfuls. Where you know it, and you kind of know, like in initiations in the jungle. Um, a lot of times, and this is not how you do it in a psycho-spiritual setting, they keep giving you iboga, giving you iboga until they stick a pin in you and you can't feel uh, the prick of they the They give pin. you like 15 grams or something. Yeah, just crazy amounts. Um, but you, you just never know. And and there's many ways that I've had um, in Gabon, uh, different preparations of iboga. Like I had this tea concentrate um, at one point, and that was probably the deepest journey I've had. And I have no idea how much iboga was in that tea, but it was very, very strong. It hit me immediately. I was completely laid out. I don't remember moving for like three days. I just remember this like feeling dizzy and all the spinning and this portal opening and going right into the spirit world and then like just being completely laid out for who knows how long I lost complete sense of time. Yeah, for for me, I've done it in a, in a Western context and it was a weekend affair. They would give you three, four grams. Mm-hmm. In, um, you know, they would give you three, four grams, then they would leave you for an hour and a half, then you would come back and they would ask you to describe what you saw and yes. they would help interpret it. Yes. Their approach is that, you know, the subconscious doesn't speak English. Yes. It speaks in, in mood and forms and shapes and, and, you know, you need to have some sort of understanding of this language yeah. to help the, the participant to, to, to decipher. And, uh, and that was interesting. And it, for, for me and for the people around me, it was mostly, you know, personal material. Um, it wasn't so much like in ayahuasca where you go to like, you know, to the ethereal world, to the to the astral and angels. And uh, do, do you feel that for all the people you supervise, this is a s- similar experience? Yeah. So, you know, what you're talking about, the, the material tends to be kind of a life review where you're reviewing certain things that are happening in your life, certain events, maybe certain behaviors, mental patterns. Um, and, uh, the medicine is designed to kind of purge all of, all of that out. Although there can be even deeper mystical experiences like you were talking about where you do travel, which you would think more is associated with ayahuasca. And typically that comes with, with higher doses or on the second night, which is the night of rebirth. Um, but there's just a lot of cleansing, especially in Western society, that we have to do to clear us before we can actually travel into the spirit world. And so, you know, the aboga won't take you there unless you're clean. You know, you can't have any any baggage before before you get to travel. So it, it goes deep into the body. Some people, um, especially if they're there because of a chronic illness or, you know, something physical with the body, it could be really focused on that, which can be also uncomfortable and painful. And you, the, the visionary aspect of Iboga isn't always reliable. It's, it's an onirphrenic. It puts you in like a, a dream state. And in that dream state, sometimes you kind of fade in and fade out and you, um, you know, can see specific things. And also I would say the best part of it all is even though you are reviewing sometimes really dark, maybe even past life material um, that could be very, very dark, 
Um, the aboga has the most incredible sense of humor. Uh, you know, it it just, um, you know, I've had experiences where it was just trying to show me something and then I wasn't necessarily getting the, the hints. You know, I was playing Pictionary with my subconscious, basically. And then finally, when I understood, it was almost like this vibration in my body, this like blissful vibration. And all of a sudden, these pygmies pop out and there's fireworks and they're waiting flags and they're like yay so to me uh, the aboga um, has this ability to not only just take you into the darkness but it can kind of make fun of it in a way that is just the, the like dark it's like watching a dark comedy you're like all of a sudden you know in the dark and then it's like totally making light of it and I also notice um, that uh, it 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 shows you um, this intelligence, like it opens this doorway into this intelligence, which I recognize as Iboga, like the spirit of Iboga itself. And you can't even remember the level of intelligence because it's so nuanced and it's so, um, you know, awe striking when, when you receive it and you can have these conversations in the medicine where you're just asking questions like, what is my purpose? Or, you know, for me, when I went through my last initiation in Gabon in, in 2019 was when I received the, um, the message from Iboga that I had to write this book, Seeding Consciousness. This was my like integration homework. And it was like giving me the name. It was giving me the titles of the chapters, like what I was going to write about. And it was so clear. And that's the difference between um, in my experience and what others have shared that Iboga gives you really clear messages when it communicates with you. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. This is so fascinating. Uh, I want to pick on one thing you said, which I think is important for the for whoever is interested to this kind of practice, this idea of, you know, do your homework and, 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 and you know, do your cleaning up. Yeah. You know, Jamie Will talks about the contemporary use of psychedelic as a um, bliss junkie and uh, peak experience whore or something. Yes. Like and, um, and, you know, like, with any teacher, you know, if we believe that these plant medicine are plant teachers because they allow your, your access to uh, to this, you know, field of wisdom and and knowledge, um, you know, you go to, you know, you get the lesson, you get the information, but then you have to do the homework, you have to do the integration. Otherwise, you keep on going to a teacher knocking to his door, I want more lesson, but the teacher will lose interest in you if you don't do the homework. And so this is something which took me a long time to fully understand because you always get, if not a peak experience, but that clear headed, that bliss, if not during the ceremony in the morning. And that can be um, very dangerous because it would basically prevent you to do your cleaning up. Okay, this is great. Let me just ask a little bit about um, where are we going with all this? So you're writing a book, you're opening a center. Yes. Um, what's your, you know, if, um, what's the name of your center in the Azores? Hugh. Hugh. H U. Yes. Yeah, and that came to me through the medicine as well. What and does it mean, uh, you? I, I received the name. And um, I found out that it actually is the tongue of Thoth, Thoth being one of the gods of the um, of Egypt, um, who some believe uh, built built the Great Pyramid. And it's the sound that is made when wisdom hits the initiate. Mm. In which tradition, sorry? Uh, in Egyptian cosmology, so Kemetic wow. Uh, wisdom. Wow, yeah. wow. Okay, so... I'm going to ask you an exercise that this branding company made me do. So imagine 20 years from now, so we are in 2042, wow. and there is a, f a article in the New York Times about who. What would, it, what would you like it to say? Oh, it would, you know, I feel like he is an entity outside of myself, and um, what it's shown me, like it led me to the Azores. I never even anticipated that that was going to be the place that we would build. I'd never even been there. Um, and it's an incredible place, by the way, just truly a magical gem of, of wonder. Um, and when I think about Hugh, I see there being these 
uh, nodes within the planet. And each one of these nodes is really based on all the principles of completely holistic living. And that means the buildings, how they're built, uh, using sacred geometries, um, how the food is grown, you know, using permaculture principles and uh, biodynamic farming and um, how, you know, the, the structure of the staff, you know, is, is approached in really creating an environment that is embodying what it's bringing to the world in terms of, of consciousness and connection. And um, so I feel like there's going to be um, somewhere between 9 to 12 of these centers literally in the next 20 years. And um, this is the first template. We're also looking at building. We have uh, land in uh, Texas, um, a, a ranch in Texas that we're, we're developing another project that is a community as well. So, um, you know, by the time... Um, you know, 20 years rolls around, I want to see these different nodes where, um, you know, illuminated individuals who have really done the work and are really embodying and living in their life are coming and teaching along with elders. And there's a deep reciprocity within the, the model of everything and how it works together. And, um, you know, people just see this as a place that you can go and connect and meet people and have that transference of wisdom. Beautiful. So you see seven, eight of the center. Mm -hmm. So Azores, Texas, can you? Well, uh, some of the some of the places that I've received and I've been investigating is uh, Greece, uh, Uruguay. Um, and, uh, potentially the Bahamas, um, I'm still really listening because, you know, everything that I do is really an exercise of drawing from, uh, a deeper consciousness, a deeper guidance from, you know, the medicine, from soul, from, you know, our soul group and our, our purpose together, which I really, truly believe in and really listening to, you know, what's what's mine to do. You know, I might be, receive information about, oh, Colorado or some place, but I might be there to kind of help someone else in creating something in, in some small way. And so I can't say necessarily exactly, but I do know that, um, you know, that that the places have kind of started speaking. And as each place is ready, the the, the everything fell into place like with the azores it literally was like i got the message that i was uh going to uh find this land with hot springs which had no idea that there was really no land for sale with hot springs in the azores so i talked to a few people in the community in the island of so miguel Literally, they said, oh, yeah, you're not going to find that. That's a hot commodity. And uh, within uh, two weeks, one person called me and said, guess what? I found your land. And so we flew to Azores uh, during COVID. We um, were able to secure this land. And um, at the time, we didn't even have the resources to, to really fully do the project that we wanted to do. And interestingly, there was a program that expired right at the end of 2020, um, Portugal 2020, and we received uh, grants and loans from the Portuguese government to um, cover a big percentage of the center. And that gave us the ability to really focus on building it and really perfecting it without having to worry about finding investment and, and all that. And so, yeah, it's truly been... A, completely guided and there were times where I was like questioning like okay is this actually going to happen and it was just literally like every moment that I took a step forward and trust something else would show up that was the piece the next piece of that puzzle and that's what I talk about a lot in the book Seeding Consciousness is understanding that process of connecting and getting the information so that you can really move forward from that place of you know co-creation with the universe beautiful beautiful and um yesterday i did a um, holotropic breath work and i had this strong download that um you know if your intention are pure and you really operate from the heart then you can tap into some sort of like energetic highways it's like the universe play balls with you 
and what prevents you for the connection to the higher frequency is your ego. And so it's, it's it really, I had this image like, you know, in a radio when you're looking, you know, like I'm thinking about being in the, on a boat and you look on the radio for the station and you go, <laughs> and I feel that the bigger your ego is, the more interference there is in finding that frequency. And uh, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful download. Um, 5MEO, do you work also with 5MEO or it's more like a personal practice? I have historically worked with 5MEO DMT. I used to do uh, a retreat through a company that I, I started seven years ago called Psychedelic Journeys, where we would do retreats in countries where the you know specific medicines were, were legal, like Costa Rica and Mexico. Um, because of a lot of controversy around sustainability with uh, Bufo Alvarius, I haven't been doing those retreats um, because... You know, working with the synthetic now is kind of more the synthetic form of 5-MeO-DMT is, is more kind of the, the general approach that has been happening, but it is also kind of a legal um, issue. And so because the, the synthetic form is not legal in, in a lot of places. So um, I have, I've probably worked with, I don't know, 1,500 or more people oh, with, wow. with it historically. And um, it's an incredible medicine. It's really, really powerful and also one that should be treated with a lot of great respect because, you know, it can open up really deep stuff really quickly within an indiv individual. And um, right now it's incredibly popular, but it's definitely not something that you uh, want to take lightly. And, and it's not always the best medicine to start off with because of its intensity. But maybe let's take another couple of minutes um, to explain the effect. You know, for, for me, was the closest thing to a mystical experience. Yeah. You feel like projected into the arm of God. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you feel you feel this unbounded sense of 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 forgiveness and compassion and wholeness and and um yeah and and I felt a similar um feeling with the with the holotropic breathing. Mm -hmm. The the this idea of um being in presence of God and also feel like you know, you want to devote your life to God, feel like I'm a servant of God. Yes. Um, unfortunately, these feelings goes away fast. Yeah. Can be like a dream. Yeah. But so how, how is it, how is the, not for you, but what, can you explain on average this 1500 session, where would the, the DMT take people to? Mm. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because um, when you think about this idea of visiting these realms of complete consciousness, of, you know, connection without the ego, um, and really a kind of a deeper understanding of, of what's happening on the bigger scale on a universal level, I think that it restores such a deep trust in whatever's happening. And I really feel like it's the medicine of surrender because as you're coming back into the body, um, you know, and not everyone's able to travel that far because you have to be able to let go and surrender to be able to get there. And sometimes there is some purging along the way because there's things that need to be integrated in order to be able to fully surrender. But as you're returning you, you can kind of see those parts of the ego um, many times coming back in and you can kind of decide, is that really something that I want to keep in, you know, this personality of who I am, who I, I exist in this world and I have a life in this world. I know there's something bigger than that. But, um, you know, what what is the best service to myself, to humanity, to my purpose in terms of how to integrate that? And again, it's it, it's easy to forget because, um, you know, with with DMT, you know, 5-MeO DMT and NDMT and these holotropic states that actually induce endogenous DMT in the body. Um, we, uh, that's what it is. You, this, do you think this has been tested with fMRI? Yes. 
Yes. So there is the same reduction of blood supply in the in the default mode network. Yes. I see. So it's the change of blood flow, but it's also a simultaneous um, activation of 5-HT1A serotonin, 5-HT2A, and 5-HT7A, which is kind of like the gateway to God. And the more activated it is, the the deeper opening and complete uh, dissolution of ego. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Trish, thank you very much. Um, okay, the center is not open, the book is not out, but so if people want to work with you now, yeah, give us a little bit of um, some links that we're going to put in the show notes on, on how people can know more about you or work with you and when the book and the center will open and where they can find news about that. Oh, thank you so much. It was such an honor to talk with you and uh, love all your experience. You're so knowledgeable in all these areas. So it's fun, fun to play back and forth. And I um, have a website, psychedelicjourneys.com. Um, if you join that mailing list, I keep everyone updated on everything that's happening. Uh, and it's really easy to just, you know, click the mailing list button and, and join. And then um, my nonprofit Ancestral Heart, which is really focused on indigenous reciprocity, um, is ancestralheart.com. And um, really, that's been something that has been deeply rewarding for me. We've just been doing some incredible work um, this last year with the Kogi Mamus in La Sierra in Colombia. And uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we helped um, the Kogi to form a trust and um, purchase back their ancestral homelands, which were belonging to farmers prior. And a lot has happened. They just got a UNESCO designation for the Kogi wisdom as a sacred site and uh, deemed as a sacred wisdom to be preserved, which is a UNESCO is, is a United Nations designation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be continuing to support the Mamus and um, I've been doing a lot of work with a nonprofit um, partner in Gabon called Blessings of the Forest. And Blessings of the Forest is specifically planting sustainable bo- iboga under Nagoya Protocol, which gives the benefits back to the Buiti tribes. And so they have built this relationship with 14 um, villages in Gabon outside of um, Libreville in the jungles where um, they're planting sustainable iboga. And we raised uh, 105000 this year to support them. And I'm excited to you know support them again in this coming year. And um, other than that, my my Instagram is at Psychedelic Journeys. Would love for people to uh, stay updated and um, we'll give you guys the published date for my book, which I should have a published date in the coming new year. And I know it will be out um, in 2023 and then our center will be open in 2024. Amazing. Thank you very much, Trisha. And we'd love to have you back on the podcast for the Psychedelic Confessions where we can... Uh, pick more your heart and soul on your personal experience with uh, all this medicine looking forward to see you again me too thank you so much Coca sonara e sonara yente Coca sonara e sonara yente